Um, bom dia. Uh, uh, meu português é muito ruim, assim que uh, eu falarei uh, em inglês. Um, uh, primeiro quero dizer que uh, é uma inspiração uh, estar aqui. Com, ah, wrong language. I'm so pleased to be here with you today. Uh, this, uh, I adore libraries, I adore bookstores, uh, I adore artistic architecture. Uh, this, uh, this place is an inspiration. It's an inspiration. I'm delighted to be here. I also want to thank uh, Vinicius and the organizers of this wonderful meeting uh, for inviting me uh, here. Uh, I've wanted for many years to collect my thoughts on consciousness, but I never really had an opportunity. So uh, you're the guinea pigs. Uh, consciousness is an absolutely fascinating subject, which, um, uh, very mysterious. Uh, and um, uh, it's wonderful that one can talk about it openly now. When I was a student, if you mentioned, if you said you wanted to think about consciousness, uh, uh, that would be the end of your career, you know. It was a forbidden topic, and it's wonderful that we can now come out of the closet and say we're interested in this very deep, very difficult, uh, um, uh, elusive uh, question. And in particular, um, these, uh, this talk is a reaction to a wonderful book. I still remember what uh, a splash it made when it first came out in 1996, I think it was, David Chalmers' uh, book. Um, and um, my specialty is information theory, and Chalmers is basically talking in his book, proposing a thesis about consciousness and information. So I think that 20 years further on, um, if Chalmers redid his book, he uh, might well take up some of the topics that I'd like to discuss with you this morning. So um, let's begin. Okay, so this is, this is Chalmers' book. I don't know if it's translated into Portuguese. Um, it's, it's a beautifully written book. Uh, David Chalmers was from Australia. I think he was doing his PhD thesis with um, Doug Hofstadter at the University of Indiana. Um, the book is beautifully written. The ideas are also beautiful. Uh, it was published in a, very nicely by Oxford University Press, a wonderful publisher. And um, it was like a bolt of lightning out of the blue. Um, Unfortunately, uh, my impression is that Chalmers, after this, has done nothing of uh, the same <laughs> magnitude as his first work, which is so original, in part because he got sucked into an academic career in the United States and became a much more conventional thinker. He was an outsider here. This is basically a book by an outsider with a good mind and who writes beautifully because it's an English kind of English. He's from Australia. Now Chalmers writes American English, which we all know is not as good <laughs> as English English. Okay, so this is his book, and in particular there are two chapters that I want to talk about. Uh, there's chapter eight, Consciousness and Information, which is the title of my talk. Very important to notice that he's saying speculation. This is all speculation. This talk is all speculation. It's uh, provocacion. No? Um, and the last chapter, chapter 10, on inter the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, I, as someone who thinks a lot about information, I immediately, when the book was published, opened the book to chapter 8. And um, let me tell you what he says in chapter 8. Uh, where did I put the control? Right pocket, thank you. Um, okay, 
what Ch Chalmers says in the problem of consciousness is a very big problem. It, it doesn't fit in a materialist worldview, right? It fits more in the worldview of, of medieval theology, for example. I mean, is the world a big object or is it a big idea in the mind of God? So the, the problem with consciousness is that it seems that if you mention the topic, you're some kind of mystic, um, which I don't believe that that to be the case at all. So, so if consciousness, though, doesn't fit in very well in contemporary physics, for example, I, mejor dicho, uh, it doesn't fit at all in contemporary physics, right? So, so what to do about consciousness? Well, the simplest hypothesis would be that everything is conscious. You know, uh, if you take an idealist rather than a materialist philosophy, if, if the world is built out of consciousness, consciousness is no longer a problem. The problem is to explain matter or the illusion of matter. So uh, I think this is an interesting point of view to think about, especially because it's completely opposed to the spirit of the time. And one should always be opposed to the spirit of the time, otherwise there's no progress. So, did I do something awful, like turn off the... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, so, so Chalmers is a version of panpsychism. We're going to build the world out of information, not out of matter. In the normal view, matter would be the fundamental substance of the world, and consciousness would be an epiphenomenon, maybe come built on top. Uh, but it's the simplest viewpoint that makes consciousness as material is to say the world is made out of consciousness, or it's made out of mind, or it's made out of information. And then the problem is to explain how come it looks like the world is made out of matter. And, and um, the, so, and that's the simplest approach. I think in dealing, thinking about something as difficult as consciousness, as profound and elusive, one should start, uh, the principle of parsimony is important. So what's attractive to me in Chalmers' thesis is that it's a very simple, straightforward idea, uh, which, if it were true, would make consciousness less mysterious. Um, and I think one should try to see how far you can get with a simple, straightforward idea before uh, having to make it more complicated. So it's a good starting point, at any way. So his idea is, as you can see here, that any physical system uh, that is capable of representing and processing n bits of information has n bits of consciousness. Now, as a mathematician, what I like about this is that he's measuring consciousness. It's always good if you can measure the amount of consciousness. Um, it's also good because it, some systems will be very conscious, other systems will be less conscious. So that, you know, sounds, sounds good. He also, Chalmers in his chapter eight, uh, uh, bows, uh, speaks um, with praise of the physicist John Wheeler's it from bit slogan, which is a very provocative idea of Wheeler, especially at the time, it seemed very provocative. Maybe matter, maybe information is primary and matter is secondary. Um, it from bit would be a world made of information rather than matter. And he also refers to quantum mechanics in the chapter 10, and that's of course because quantum mechanics is a step in the direction of idealism rather than materialism, no? Um, so, so that is likely to be friendlier to consciousness. Um, so these are, these are the main ideas, I think, in Chalmers, and they, they, they're pretty good, I think. So let's... Did I miss a... no. Okay, so I should mention that there is another theory of consciousness that I think is uh, maybe more popular today. Um, it's uh, Tononi's um, theory of integrated information. <coughs> and uh, here are two books on the topic that have been published recently. Um, uh, this my okay um, so I think I have to acknowledge that this theory seems to me at the moment to to uh, be attracting more attention 
than Chalmers' idea. So I just want to, for completeness, mention that uh, to say that you'll see I'm deliberately ignoring Tononi's ideas. It's not that I haven't heard of them. I'll say more about this later. Okay, so another fact, the, the question is a lot has happened in 20 years. One thing that happened is that Tononi came up with his theory. Another thing that's happened is a whole movement uh, in the direction of what I like to call uh, digital philosophy uh, and a related topic which is digital physics. And these are both uh, worldviews that uh, attempt to think of the world as discrete, not continuous. That's why it's digital. Uh, in fact, they're really the idea of building the world out of information as a new fundamental substance. Uh, information and algorithm rather than matter and energy. Information would be the fundamental substance rather than matter, and in place of energy, which gives a dynamics to matter, you would have algorithms which transform information. Okay? So this is a... This idea of this new fundamental substance as information is, is not such a new idea, really. If you go back to Aristotle, he talks about form. Uh, and there's the idealism of the Middle Ages. Uh, so this is um, a new version of an old idea. Ideas keep coming back in new, improved form. Okay, I'd like to recommend a few books on this topic just to show that there is such a movement. It's very tentative. It's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a proposal, a project. It's not something that has been fully achieved. Or So I would, this book I know is uh, James Gleick's book, The Information of History, A Theory of Flood. I think that um, Compania das Letras uh, has, a, uh, has it in Portuguese. It's a, it's a wonderful book. It's actually three books. Um, I recommend the middle book, which is about a, a theory. Um, um, then um, the only two books I know that are on digital philosophy um, are in Italian, as it turns out, and have not been translated into any other language. Um, so there's a book by my friend Ugo Pagallo, Introduzione alla Filosofia Digitale, from 2005, um, which didn't attract too much attention, but was the first book which mentions Filosofia Digitale in the title. And then there's a more recent book um, with a fun title, Bitbang, instead of Big Bang. La Nascita della Filosofia Digitale. This book is really uh, a very interesting, fun book, I have to say, uh, even though Ugo's my friend, good friend. Uh, and Andrea Vaccaro is a very interesting person. It turns out he is a theologian. He is a Catholic priest whose specialty is theology. He has published books on points of uh, Catholic dogma, believe it or not. But he has very wide interests, and I think this is a wonderful book. Um, um, my impression is that it's mostly his work. Uh, Giuseppe Longo is not the Giuseppe Longo de la Col Normal Superior. It's another Giuseppe Longo, an Italian information theorist. And I think his contribution to the book is a dialogue. The last chapter is a dialogue between the two authors. So this is the work of a theologian with very broad interests. And I think, if I can say, one of the things that attracted him to this topic is one way of presenting th this whole, uh, I don't know what to call it, system of ideas, is to say that according to Pythagoras, all is number, God is a mathematician. And this, this new viewpoint suggests it's a neo-Pythagorean viewpoint, it's a similar idea, but brought up to date. It would be um, all is algorithm, um, God is a programmer. So, <laughs> so
So, um, so there are these two books. And a funny thing happened with digital physics. That's the idea. I, I know pioneers in this area um, um, are good friends of mine. Um, are Stephen Wolfram and Edward Fretkin. And as far as I know, they were not inspired by John Wheeler, Zit from Bit. They sort of lived in a different community, intellectually. Um, and um, the, the, um, Wolfram, Fredkin, and I, in our different ways, were interested in exploring the idea of the world as computation. And there are other, lots of other people who've worked on this too. The world as a big computation. The universe is a big computation where the universe is constantly calculating its next state from its current state via an, algorithmic, via an algorithm for this. This is the time evolution of the universe thought of as a large discrete system with discrete time. Okay, so this is very discrete viewpoint. Now, so our idea was basically classical physics. I have to confess, this is almost a dirty word nowadays because while we were busy trying to work out this idea of the world as a giant computation, a giant computer, a giant Turing machine, a whole bunch of physicists were doing another version of this whole set of ideas and much more successfully. And I'm referring to um, quantum information theory and quantum computation, which is a very um, prosperous research area uh, with lots of wonderful work that's been done, although there is no quantum computer yet uh, that you can buy to do real work, but as the, it's revolutionized um, quantum mechanics. When I was a student, a course on quantum mechanics might start with the Schrodinger equation. And now there are courses on quantum mechanics which start with the qubit. Now what's the qubit? Well, a qubit you know, there's zero and one bits, right? That's Shannon information theory, and um, which is statistical. Then there's algorithmic information theory, where you're talking about bits of software. It's not a statistical theory. You're measuring complexity in terms of bits of software. But then there is quantum information theory, which is more like the Shannon information theory, except the qubit is not a zero or a one. It's sort of a mixture a quantum mechanical mixture of zero and one. A qubit can uh, have a certain probability amplitude to be zero and a probability amplitude to be one. And probability amplitudes in quantum mechanics are very strange probabilities because they have a direction as well as a magnitude, unlike normal probability theory. They have phase, in other words. And um, that's how you get um, probabilities can add destructively in quantum mechanics, whereas in normal probability theory, probabilities only add constructively. So this is a, um, and this, uh, this has been the, actually the greatest success of digital physics has been in this area. And here you have, a t uh, there are many books on this topic. Um, the Universe as Quantum Information by Vladko Vidral. He happens to be the, I think, the assistant director of a very good, very large group in Singapore working on quantum technologies. The director is Arthur Eckert, I believe. And uh, they're doing a lot of very good work, theoretical work, and also they've promised the government of Singapore to install some kind of quantum cryptographic network through the whole of Singapore. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see if they succeed in doing that. So uh, quantum cryptography is the big application of quantum information theory at this point. Com new computers are not yet a mature technology, not even, uh, you don't even have prototypes, you have lab bench uh, demos. But for cryptographic work, it is a already uh, ripe to apply these ideas as a new technology. So that's been very exciting. So while Wolfram, Fredkin, and I were trying to do a sort of a classical vision of the universe as a computation, this quantum mechanical vision of the universe as computation has been a tremendous success. They've stolen our thunder is an expression in English. 
Um, but actually, I don't think anybody's stolen anything. I think these are mutually reinforcing attempts to go in a similar direction. So I think we're all fellow travelers, shall we say. Okay, so, um, so um, Chalmers was only aware of it by it from bit and John Wheeler's uh, provocations. And a lot has happened in the 20 years since then. This is. Now, another thing that I've already alluded to is that Chalmers, um, when he talks in his chapter eight about, speculates about whether information theory is perhaps might lead to a fundamental theory of consciousness, uh, he was referring only to what I would call classical information theory at this point, uh, and that's the main publication there. Uh, Warren Weaver, had, it's just an article, um, a propaganda piece. The work was done by Shannon. Uh, we, uh, at that time, Norbert Wiener seemed like a very important person also who had related ideas, but history has decided to forget about Wiener. Uh, and Warren Weaver, in fact, was a uh, administrator for I think it was the Rockefeller Foundation, and his job was to find important new areas and fund them and make them happen. And he thought that information theory was an important subject, so he wrote an article for Scientific American explaining Shannon's theory of information, and they packaged that in this book, uh, which was a tremendous success, this book, um, um, eclipsing the tremendous success of Cybernetics, the book by Norbert Wiener that I was really pleased to see in Portuguese across the street. I just bought a copy. Um, and when Shannon published this theory, uh, two very long articles in the Bell System Technical Journal, it was called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. But when it came out in this small book of the University of Illinois Press, it was called The Mathematical Theory of Communication. So obviously, this is a step forward in, uh, how do you say, claiming turf, you know, putting a flag and saying, this part of Antarctica belongs to Argentina, for example. So they, okay, so then there's another uh, kind of information theory that I was one of the people who worked to create. Um, there were a lot of us, but maybe the three, name, three main names are Andrei Komogorov, uh, Raymond Solomonov, and myself, we all have Russian sounding last names, but Kolmogorov was really in Russia. I was in Argentina and uh, Solomonov was in Boston. He was a good friend of Marvin Minsky, uh, the AI guru, who by the way said that we are a carbon-based life form whose destiny it is to create a silicon-based life form to replace us which from the previous talk seems to be happening. So, looks like Marvin, unfortunately, uh, was too... Okay, so here we have a different kind of measure of information also in bits, but they're bits of software, they're bits of uh, algorithm, to specify an algorithm. Whereas this is sort of a Shannon uh, information bits are a more statistical theory, actually connected with Boltzmann entropy and statistical mechanics, if you're... Uh, Physicist. It's, it's a repackaged version of Boltzmann entropy. Okay, and then there's a newer, still newer, information theory, quantum information theory, and this maybe is an important book to cite, Nielsen and Chuang. This was Cambridge University Press. This is a magnum opus, a very thick book. I don't know if it's completely out of date by now, but when it was published, it was for a time at least the Bible of quantum computation and quantum information. 20, but, you know, uh, 17 years is a long time in a field that is advancing very rapidly. Uh, I don't know if they've updated the book. At any rate, it's a milestone. Uh, sort of like the book by Wheeler and Kip Thorne on gravitation, which was also a doorstopper, a very thick book. Another equally thick book, of course, is Wolfram's A New Kind of Science. So anyway. I like to write very small books. I think any idea that's important can be stated in a few sentences. There are other people who think if it doesn't take 800 pages, it can't be significant. 
So these are different intellectual personalities. Okay, so we have now a problem because Chalmers wants to propose that maybe a fundamental theory of consciousness might be based or connected with, a, with information theory, but we now have three versions of information theory. At the time, in Chalmers chapter 8, there were actually two versions of information theory because it turns out that Shannon information really has two different kinds of information. Uh, one of them is the one that is better known, which is discrete information. But um, half of uh, Shannon's book deals with continuous information, which is more relevant to things like radio transmissions or telephone lines, to analog uh, information channels rather than uh, digital information channels. Now, the world has gone digital, but the, digital, the digitalization or digital technology is a fake. Underneath, it's analog, but analog is, is evil, so the whole point of engineering now is to simulate uh, uh, discrete uh, information using dirty, noisy, analog information underneath, but you want to hide that under the rug. If the engineering is done well, you don't see that there's any analog nature to the information transmission process, it should look discreet if, if it's done well. Okay. Did I skip to the next chart? By no. Okay. So going back, well, I've been saying, uh, okay, so uh, actually uh, I, I got a little bit out of order. I started on a topic that I'll look at in a different chart. Let's go back to an important part of Chalmers' proposal that any physical system that represents and processes n bits of information has n bits of consciousness, this panpsychism, a version of panpsychism. So he has also a beautiful continuity argument. Um, and the, the argument is, is very persuasive. You know, obviously human beings are conscious, and those of us who love dogs will insist that dogs are conscious. Cats are already a little more mysterious, but a lot of us love cats too. And um, what happens as you go down? You know, does consciousness suddenly blink out when, you, when the organisms become simpler? If you keep going down, you'll eventually get to insects and viruses, right? So I think the nice thing about Ch Chalmers' proposal, it, it's natural, he measures it in bits of consciousness, is that you can have systems that are very conscious, have a lot of consciousness, and you can have systems that have very little consciousness. The smallest amount, I guess, would be one bit of consciousness, which might be an on-off switch, or it might be a thermostat. So, um, so in this sense, then, viruses and insects might be conscious, but they would have a lot less consciousness than, than we do. Okay? So I'd now like to ask a few embarrassing questions, which... Uh, Chalmers doesn't ask, I don't think. One embarrassing question is, uh, are computers conscious? Another embarrassing question is, um, the human body contains actually um, perhaps many focuses of consciousness. There's the immune system. The immune system is very sophisticated. It represents and processes information. Could the immune system be conscious? Another problem is the unconscious mind. Um, we have a conscious mind and we have an unconscious mind. Is the unconscious mind conscious? Um, it, it, it would be a different consciousness, you know. It would be sort of a schizophrenic theory that you have different focuses of consciousness. Now, I think this is a serious question because I personally have experienced uh, at least two sort of dramatic incidents of uh, having another person inside me. One event was I was driving on a highway in the U.S. You know, there you spend all your time driving on highways, right? You live inside the car. And it was very late at night, and I was very tired. I swear I hadn't drunk any alcohol, but I was very tired. And I fell asleep at the wheel, driving at, uh, I don't know, 100 kilometers an hour. And after a while, I suddenly woke up. And somebody had continued driving the car. I don't know whom. I'm still here. I'm not dead. So, who was the person who was driving while I had fallen asleep? All of a sudden, I wake up, and I'm at a different place on the highway. I'm further along on the highway. Uh, another example like that uh, that happens to me, maybe it happens to you, is you're reading. 
you're reading a book, and maybe you get distracted by hearing somebody talk or music or by a stray thought. So you go off on a tangent, and then all of a sudden you go back to the book that you were reading, but you're not at the same place. Somebody kept reading. Who, what person was that? You know, this has happened, I don't know. Yeah, of course, scientists are not supposed to accept subject, subjective uh, evidence, but here we don't have much choice, right? There's also, uh, well, I'll talk more about the human unconscious and its computational power later. Let's see what, this is going to be a surprise for me, what the next chart says. Oh, we can also take Chalmers' continuity argument in a direction he doesn't take it, which is upwards, not downwards. If we take it upwards, does a family, does a corporation, does a nation uh, is, is, have some kind of group consciousness? Um, and to go as far as you can, let's take the whole universe. If the whole universe is information and computation, if digital philosophy or digital physics works, if the universe is made of information, not matter, then Maybe the whole universe is conscious as a whole. There's some kind of global world consciousness. Um, and um, this is beginning to sound suspiciously like God. I'm not a particularly religious person, although one has feelings of the sublime occasionally when you're climbing a mountain in the snow or something like that. But um, anyway, these ideas are not... Like most ideas, they're not new, they're versions of old ideas. Uh, I admire greatly Leibniz, and he has a late work, very short, very cryptic, called the Monodology, uh, just, just two years before he died. And it's a idealist ontology. It says the world is built out of minds that he called mo monads. And monads have different degrees of perception. There's the perfect monad, the maximum monad, which perceives everything perfectly. Then we're somewhere in the middle, and then simpler organisms would have muddier perceptions. And I don't know if Leibniz talks about whether rocks or uh, almost inanimate objects have very limited perception, but some perception. Um, Leibniz was, had a problem. His problem was he loved modern science, which was just beginning, but he also loved religion, which he thought, by the way, was very important for European political stability. Uh, he suspected that the French were going in a bad direction, uh, as the French Revolution showed, I suppose. Uh, so um, he wanted to combine these two systems of ideas, and it looks very hard to combine religion with modern science. They seem to contradict each other. That's very bad. Right, because it means if you love modern science, you're going to have to ditch religion completely. So uh, Leibniz tried to find a way to show that there, it was possible that they were compatible, actually. And I think this is, explains the very strange structure of the monodology. It was an attempt to show that you could have it both ways without having a contradiction. This is something that may not disturb us greatly today, but I think intellectually it's a very interesting effort on his part. Okay, so let's see, what is the next? Ah, this, I started on this uh, too soon. Chalmers is aware that Shannon has two kinds of different information, as I said, discrete and continuous. And um, he dismissed the continuous information. Continuous Continuity, real numbers, are very bad from the point of view of information theory because pi, 3.1415926, is an infinite amount of information. So if you're trying to measure the amount of consciousness, if the world is continuous, any physical system will have an infinite amount of consciousness, and this measure of consciousness becomes trivial. So Chalmers argues that noise pr prevents c uh, c uh, analog systems in practice from having infinite information content. So he dismisses continuous information, which I think is fine. I think there are now better arguments for, dis there are more arguments, additional arguments for dismissing continuous information. 
which by the way, if you take them to an extreme, they also are arguments against the universe being continuous. They're arguments against the existence of real numbers as physical objects. So one, one is sort of a practical consideration. Uh, one of my colleagues used to be Rolf Landauer, a very fine physicist, and um, Rolf has a beautiful article in Physics Today, had in 1991, Information is Physical. And um, if information is physical, you look and see what have physicists been able to measure? How many digits of precision have they been able to measure any physical quantity? And the answer is not many. I don't know if 20 digits, maybe 30, these are the most precisely measured uh, physical quantities. Uh, I don't think it gets to 30. It may not even get to 20. I think, I think um, maybe even not to 10. So I'm a theoretician, so those details don't bother me so much. So um, now that's a, one kind of argument. That's a sort of a practical argument that you can't really measure any physical quantity with too many digits of precision. But there's also a theoretical argument which has come up. Um, there is something, there is an area, there are black holes, and um, at least theoretically there are black holes, and it looks like the center of galaxy has black holes. So um, um, the physics of black holes is a very interesting question. Um, because it ought to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity, and these theories don't really speak to each other very well. But there are some interesting, uh, physicists call them phenom phenomological theories, attempting to discuss thermodynamics of black holes, which means how much information can be contained in a black hole. And um, these are pretty good arguments. They're not quantum theories of gravity, but they are, uh, uh, physically very convincing uh, arguments. So one of these arguments is the Bekenstein bound, Jacob Bekenstein. Um, this is related to work of Stephen Hawking also on black holes, having to do with thermodynamics of black holes or um, information content of black holes. And it says that um, you start off by saying that black holes have a limited information content which to calculate it, you look at the event horizon, and um, basically you divide into little cells one Planck distance on a side. Planck distance is the distance at which space-time sort of gets torn to bits apart. Bits is a bad word to use, because you would have virtual particle creation uh, that would form little black holes. I mean, it's, it's hard to think of continuous space-time when you get to that scale, that small scale called the Planck distance. Anyway, um, then there's an argument called the holographic principle, which generalizes this, this theorem about the information content on the event horizon of a black hole to any physical system. What you basically do is you imagine the physical system collapsing into a black hole, and um, that gives you a bound, an upper bound on the information content of a physical system of limited size. And you might think this upper bound would, it's in bits. How many bits of information can be contained in the physical system, represented in a physical system? And you might think that this um, bound on the um, information content of a physical system would grow as the volume of the physical system, right? That would be the natural thing to expect. However, surprise, surprise, it grows as the surface area of the physical system. Remember, I was talking about event horizon, so that's sort of related. And this is called the holographic principle, and it suggests that in some funny way, space-time is really um, discrete, not continuous. Oh, two-dimensional, not space is two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. So these are very tentative, but it's pretty, as a, to physicists, these kind of arguments, Bekenstein's arguments, are, are fairly convincing. Even though you'd really like to have a theory of quantum gravity and he doesn't, these are pretty solid arguments applying uh, thermodynamical principles, which are very well established, they apply universally in physics, to black holes, which do seem to exist, the astro astronomical evidence 
seems to suggest, and also our current theory suggests that if you have too much matter in one place, it'll collapse to a singularity. So anyway, so for the moment, this looks like an interesting, an interesting principle. So then there are no real numbers. There is no physical systems look, may look continuous, but they're not. They only have a finite amount of information. They may look three-dimensional in space, but they're really, in a sense, only two-dimensional. OK, so, so I think those are additional arguments um, to dismiss uh, analog information. Uh, Shannon information and stay with discrete Shannon information as Chalmers does in chapter 8. Now another interesting question that I started talking about out of order is the question of the um, how much information does the human brain process which would be how much consciousness does it have if Chalmers thesis, panpsychism thesis is correct. Well the, I think an interesting question is the conscious mind versus the unconscious mind, which could be another center of consciousness. Um, there is a beautiful book, at least to um, mathematicians, maybe it's forgotten. Uh, it was written by a famous French mathematician, Jacques Adamar. He was in exile in New York because it was the Second World War. And I think he actually may have, I don't know if he actually wrote the first version in English. Uh, it was published anyway, first in English and then in French. The French version doesn't look like a translation. It's slightly different from the uh, English version. And I don't know if it's in Portuguese. It's a small book. And it's a, it's a lovely book talking about creativity and mathematics. And he points out that a very good way to do mathematical research is to go to sleep. And in the morning, you may wake up with a good idea. And he's sort of saying that the unconscious mind is better at doing mathematics, uh, uh, new ideas at any rate, at wonderful new ideas, at mathematical creativity, than the conscious mind. The conscious mind is good for verifying or refuting uh, an, a wonderful idea you wake up with in the morning. That's more systematic work is fine. But coming up with a wonderful new idea, it seems to be the unconscious mind. And this would seem to require greater processing power than the processing power of the conscious mind. Because you would sort of have to search over exponentially large spaces of possibilities to find the fertile ones. Now, uh, another book that's relevant to this that I recommend is uh, actually a whole book on consciousness, a beautiful book. It's like an art book. The ver it was published in, in Danish, the Merk Verden, and that's a book that should be preserved somewhere because it was like an art book. It was just a beautiful, beautifully published with beautiful illustrations. It was just, uh, the typography was exquisite. Um, this dealt with information theory and consciousness. Um, and this book was discussed on sports programs because um, um, football players in Denmark uh, we're discussing whether Nora Tranders, I don't know how to pronounce it in Danish, you sort of mumble, right? It's a language without, I don't know if it's without vowels or without consonants, but it's <laughs> difficult for outsiders to pronounce. Um, football players, the question was whether football players consciously reacted to what was going on on the field. And the answer seems to be no, they don't have enough time to think. They react unconsciously and much faster. So this is again a suggestion that the processing ability of the unconscious mind is greater than the conscious mind. Um, anyway, it's an interesting question. He, his thesis was that consciousness is a narrow funnel. I'm not doing justice to this book. I think it's a, it should be, it, it's good to look at it when you're looking at Chalmers, when you, if you go back to Chalmers' book. Another book I recommend highly is by a uh, Argentinian, I think, um, or maybe he's a Brazilian. Oh, by the way, Chalmers is married to a Brazilian. She was in Rio recently. Uh, I think she's doing a doctorate on consciousness in babies or something to that effect. I'm also married to a Brazilian, I'm happy to say. Um, and we just had a, a, a baby, uh, he, uh, Juan, Juan Bernardo. He's three weeks old. <laughs> so this is a very interesting book dealing with... Um, there's a, 
story by Borges, of course, since I'm Argentinian, I think that Borges is one of the great uh, literary authors. And he has a, a story called Funes, the Memorials, or something like that, about someone who can't forget, who remembers everything and what a curse this is. And um, this book is saying that there are people apparently with photographic memories. Uh, von Neumann was reputed to be that way. I don't know if this story is true, but you know, the stories tend to get exaggerated as they're retold. One story was any book he had read, you could ask him, oh, on page 49, start at the end of the page and, and uh, say the words backwards. I don't know if he really had that ability. I, have, I haven't known a person with photographic memory, but an ex-girlfriend of mine, una namorada meo de, from long, long ago, she worked with a person who had photographic memory, and she worked in computer programming. And she told me this person didn't need to ever look at the manuals because remembered everything they'd seen. But her colleague wasn't very, with the photographic memory, wasn't very good, for example, at debugging because reasoning powers in his case weren't that good. And she could, she could, she could do pretty well, um, my girlfriend, um, with her not so good memory but with a greater ability to reason. Now, I don't think that anybody would say that von Neumann uh, because of his photographic memory, had limited reasoning abilities. He was also famous for his mental speed. So the human memory, there are people apparently who can fly, in, if I understood this book right, fly in a helicopter over San Paolo and then remember every building, every window that they saw. That's an enormous uh, information capacity. And that would probably be in the unconscious mind. I have argued in a paper that it might be at the level of DNA and RNA, because at the neuronal level, I don't think there's enough storage capacity to explain such a photographic memory, if it really exists. So I think this is a very interesting question. To, there are a lot of interesting questions to study. Um, now, another interesting topic that 20 years have um, enabled us to go beyond Chalmers is the question of consciousness and quantum mechanics, which is his last chapter. I think his basic argument was, as I said, that quantum mechanics seems to be friendlier to idealism than to materialism, because the Schrodinger wave function is sort of what you know, the information you have about a system. And qubits certainly are information, which is the new way of formulating quantum mechanics. But Chalmers didn't know about that. So um, quantum information theory goes a long way to um, strengthening Chalmers' thesis, I think, uh, if you believe in quantum mechanics, um, because um, if quantum mechanics is really a version of information theory, quantum information qubits, then, um, and the universe is a quantum universe, it's made up of qubits, then the universe is conscious. So, uh, well, Information and um, the quantum are the same substance. Am I getting this confused? It's another it, associating consciousness, perhaps, suggesting that consciousness can be related to quantum mechanics and suggesting that consciousness can be related to information theory, which are two separate chapters, 8 and 10, really becomes this, the same idea or a very closely related idea, which strengthens the idea. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say here, I guess. Uh, now, I thought it would be fun to end. I have, haven't been looking at how much time I've been taking. Maybe I should take a look. Uh, okay. Um, I thought it would be fun to talk about the latest advanced end with, by looking at the, as I said, this is all intended to be a provocation. Um, Chalmers says very nicely, speculation. Uh, so this is a speculation on a speculation. Um, talking about the latest advances in uh, digital physics, um, which are qubits, you know, the, 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 the redoing quantum mechanics and physics in terms of information, in terms of qubits, quantum information, and quantum computation. Um, there have been some exciting recent advances that I know some of you have heard of, but maybe not all of you. There is this wonderful idea that maybe gravity can be explained using the ideas of information. It would really be using uh, 
thermodynamic ideas, probabilities. It's a statistical effect. Gravity is a statistical theory, not a fundamental force. And it just would say that it's more probable for bodies to be close together than to be far apart. That would explain the, the attraction. It would say that gravity is not a fundamental force. And, um, and they, the people who work on this, that's uh, gravity viewed as an anthropic force, uh, there's um, as part of this project, they would get space-time out from qubits. And you would say that space-time, really, um, the world is made out of qubits. And how does space-time emerges by um, what's called entanglement of these bits. So this is uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, I don't know if Eric Verlinde is a Nobel Prize winner, but he seems to have done the most advanced work in this area. Uh, and here's an explanation of it online that is all I could understand. Uh, he's a Dutch physicist. He's a very good Dutch physicist. Now, one of the other advantages of this proposal of Verlinde, um, now one has to say that maybe journalists don't always say, that a lot of this stuff, even when it's done by a good physicist and is full of equations, is pretty speculative stuff. You know, this is not... Uh, um, 100% solid, but it's, it's, it's very interesting to a physicist. I think this work is more interesting than uh, string theory, which I never liked because I'm usually against the fashion, right? I thought that string theory was being rammed down people's throats. This, this work, I, I think, is much more interesting. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this proposal is the problem of the dark matter. There is this small problem that it seems that 90% of the matter in the universe uh, doesn't emit light. We've never seen it in our telescopes. And the, the evidence for the existence of this dark matter, non-luminous matter, is very strong. It has to do with the way um, gravities rotate, uh, galaxies rotate, and it also has to do with the movement of galaxies and galaxy clusters. Um, the way they move, uh, a galaxy, for example, if all that was there was what you saw, would have to be like our solar system. Mercury goes around the sun much faster than Jupiter. But if you look at the rotation curves of galaxies, it's more like a rigid disk, the way it rotates. And that would need you to have a halo of dark matter. That's how people explain it, except that this dark matter is invented just to solve this problem, you know, which is a problem. So this proposal, it seems, sort of gets rid of the dark matter in some way, I don't know. That seems to be one of the, perhaps suggests that you might, that with this kind of approach, you, the dark matter wouldn't be necessary because you get a slightly different kind of gravity. It's not an inverse square uh, gravity, not exactly. Okay, so this is, this is really fantastic stuff, you know, if, if, it, if it works. If, this is an, a very active area of research among very good physicists. Um, a small group of extremely good physicists. So this is positive. I would say this is, gives us optimism about how digital physics is doing. Now let me throw some d cold water. Let me dash our hopes a little bit. Uh, there, is, there are some negative things going on that would tend to give us pessimism about the, this, this, this train of research, this dis digital physics uh, quantum with qubits. And uh, probably most of you hadn't heard of this. Um, it turns out that there is a gentleman called Randall Mills in the United States. And he is a, uh, he is a fearless gentleman who has decided that he is going to replace quantum mechanics with a classical theory. And uh, this may sound totally crazy, um, but uh, if you remember your courses on quantum mechanics, the first justification for quantum mechanics is if you look at the Bohr atom, the Bohr hydrogen atom, you have a proton and an electron going around. And according to classical physics, that atom should collapse. The electron should emit electromagnetic radiation, and the electron should spiral in and fall onto the proton. And there went all our hydrogen, you know. But hydrogen is stable. so. So that's the original motivation for quantum mechanics, I think, was this. It was the Bohr atom is phenomenologically Niels Bohr, a beautiful work, but it just happened to contradict classical physics. 
So a few years later, uh, in the 1920s, uh, quantum physics was invented and solved that problem. Now, Randall Mills, however, says you can, in fact, have a stable hydrogen atom without, with classical physics. And what you have to do, it turns out that Maxwell's equations have some unusual solutions that he didn't come up with, some professors at MIT came up with. And the electron stops being a point going around the proton in hydrogen. It becomes what he calls an orbit sphere, Mills calls an orbit sphere. It's a surface. And it turns out that surfaces in motion sometimes don't emit electromagnetic radiation. So it would be a stable, it would be a stable hydrogen atom and it would be classical explanation. Now one interesting thing about this hydrogen atom is that um, if, if Mills' theory is right, you would have hydrogen atoms below the ground state. The ground state is the closest the electron can get to the proton in hydrogen. And he thinks the electrons can get closer. And these would be more stable, these would be more stable forms of hydrogen, and according to his theory, would not emit light. So if he's right, the dark matter is the most common substance in the universe, which is hydrogen, only with the electrons closer to the proton than is believed possible according to our current theories. And he says, uh, Randall Mill says, this is the explanation for the mysterious fact that the solar corona is much hotter than the solar surface. The solar surface is, I don't know, some thousands of degrees Celsius or Kelvin, whereas the corona uh, has atoms excited in a way that would require temperatures of about a million degrees. It doesn't give off visible light, though, the corona, not much. It's the surface of the sun that gives off lots of visible light. Since the corona is much hotter, it gives off uh, ultraviolet, uh, very, uh, how do you say? Very ultraviolet. These are very energetic photons of light. So they're very high frequency and very short wavelength. And they get absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. And they, we don't see them because they're not, they're not the sp part of the spectrum of light that the human eye can see. And, but they have been measured in, um, in uh, satellites outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And you get a kind of a spectrum similar to the spectrum that Mills gets in the laboratory. Uh, he has a device called the sun cell that he wants to sell, which takes hydrogen from the atmosphere and makes these hydrinos, which is, which is his name for the dark matter, which he claims is uh, hydrogen with uh, the electron uh, below the ground state, what's usually believed to be the ground state. So, um, um, the interesting thing is that Mill started with this theory and then found a physical system which he claims that the experiments show that it's emitting a, a lot of energy in the form of uh, ultraviolet light that can't be explained by, the, uh, by any conventional process. And he proposes to, make, to sell this commercially. And um, enough people believe in him that he has his own institute. He's not part of a university. He doesn't get government funding. But somebody is funding his institute. And he's been working on this for 25 years and um, doing demos and publishing papers. And um, um, if this actually turns out to work and becomes a revolutionary new technology, the idea sort of is you have this sort of sun in a bottle and then you would put uh, photovoltaics, concentrator photovoltaics around to get, a, to get electricity. If, and this would give you a, a tremendous new source of energy. The same energy that the solar corona has. Um, if this works, then we have the problem, what happens to quantum information theory, which is the most successful branch of information theory that I've been talking about a lot. So I don't know. Uh, Mills uh, is sort of con seems to be contemptuous of, of quantum mechanics. He thinks it's you know one of these metaphysical theories done by Europeans, whereas Americans aren't uh, seduced by. <laughs> He's the son of a farmer. He's obviously very brilliant. Um, got a bunch of degrees. I don't know in Boston, including a medical degree, a physics degree. Um, so there's a book about him and this project. Um, 
So I don't know. You know, in science, nothing is, is certain. Uh, you can always come back 50 or 100 years later and find out that, uh, you know, Newton's theory gets uh, uh, you get the previous theory. Some, it might be that you can combine quantum mechanics in some way with these ideas of Mills. Since no serious physicist takes his ideas seriously, um, uh, people have not been working to try to see to what extent these ideas can be combined and maybe give us a new, better theory. Um, I don't think that quantum mechanics will disappear entirely. Uh, hopefully, it'll be incorporated like Newtonian physics is incorporated into relativistic physics or classical physics into quantum mechanics. Now, one interesting thing that Mills has done is he uses his classical approach to atoms to calculate um, properties of molecules. And it's very difficult to do this with quantum mechanics. The calculations are horrendous in spaces of very high dimension. There are some phenomenological rules that people use. And um, with Mills's approach, you can actually uh, do the analytic. You can write the equations and really do the calculations. And he has a set of software that calculates, for example, ionization potentials of, of molecules. You know, how strong should a bond be, things like that. And uh, I don't know if I, one should believe the numbers he comes out with, but if you look at the predictions from the current quantum mechanics, you look at his predictions and you look at the laboratory values, um, it's uh, intriguing that his values seem to be uh, better. Now you're not really using quantum mechanics there because the calculations are too hard. You're using sort of rules of thumb based on quantum mechanics, which is the current best uh, technology. So anyway, um, what I'm trying to suggest is uh, that, um, you know, some of us are depressed by politics in different countries. One finds different reasons to be depressed about politics, but I don't think one should be depressed about the future. This meeting uh, here makes me feel encouraged about the future. There are a lot of young people here full of enthusiasm, um, and these ideas, I think, show that there is a, how do you say, sobre abundancia, overabundance of, of intriguing new ideas to work on. So I think all of you are going to have fun. Uh, thank you very much.